We have a special guest for tonight's program. And page three. Mike Carter, you want to? Thank you. He is a go-to person for learning about the history of Springfield, and he is our special featured speaker this Monday, John Sellers. If you'd like to know about the social, economic, religious, political, arts, and entertainment business, or practically any other aspect of life in and around Springfield and Green County, John is the person you would most likely seek out, as uh -huh. do many individuals and organizations have been doing for years. Let's welcome John Sellers. There you go. Thank, thank you, Kurt, for overselling it a lot. Okay, so as you can see, um, we have a mess up here. Uh, the projector has decided to uh, do something really strange. Uh, I, have, I have really nice pictures that I brought a lot of because that's what I do is pictures. Uh, and they will, be, they will look great on the uh, video when you look at it online. Uh, this is a test. This is going to see how many of you will actually go online and look at the video and see the pictures that I'm going to describe to you. Now, they're going to be up here, and they're going to be all in purple with stripes in front of them. So some of you, uh, uh, Mike and some others, that are used to looking at things through bars, this will be easy for you to work with. Uh, but for the rest of you that don't have that, you know, accomplished kind of thing, uh, why is it doing this to me? Uh, anybody know? I don't know either. Uh, huh. Now I've lost the... Uh, What's it doing, John? It's, uh, it's gone back to the home program, and there is no... Uh, oh, there it is. I found it. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, okay, let's try this again. There we go. Uh, what you're seeing here now is a, an ad from the 1856 newspaper, the weekly newspaper in Springfield. Uh, for J. A. Stevens, who has a ha has on hand a fine and well selected lot of violins, in cases of mahogany and other kinds of wood, also a lot of the best violin strings, and call and see him on the southeast corner of the public square. So this is this is 1856. Uh, we had three music shops in Springfield by 1856. So the, the city had been established for 20 years, and it was already a thriving music mecca. Uh, he also sold boots and shoes, by the way. That's the other half of this ad uh, for his store. Apparently, he had everything uh, for sale. But Springfield was always a crossroads of people. Um, the, the Native American trails all crossed here because there was a, a, a huge amount of water and wild game here. So it made it very easy for the first settlers when they came here in the 1820s and 30s to get to this location because they had trails already broken down by all the Native Americans that traveled through here, all the different tribes, especially the Osage. The Osage were the big indigenous tribe here. So there was always a lot of through traffic, people coming through here on their way to the west. Uh, we don't acknowledge it much, but Springfield was really a portal to all of the undeveloped country to the west of here. And this was the last place they would come and gather supplies and, and figure out how they were going to get to wherever it was they were going, to the southwest and, or on to the gold fields in California or wherever. And that's why this was made a station stop on the Overland stage line in the 1850s as well, about the same time as this ad. This is another ad for a company... Uh, O.H. Guffin, who was, uh, he dealt exclusively in music equipment and uh, pianos and organs and all kinds of things uh, here. And he had a shop on College Street uh, back in the late 1800s and was, uh, was quite a well-known music dealer and music man here in Springfield. Now, as I go through these pictures, uh, this is all part of the, of the archives of the History Museum on the Square. We, uh, just like Music Monday, are a 501c3 uh, dedicated to, to gathering and protecting and telling the stories of this place we call home. We began as a uh, uh, bicentennial museum. We were only going to be open for a year. We were going to be open in, 18, or in 1976 just for the one year to celebrate the bicentennial. And uh, we put out a call for people 
to loan us or donate to us photographs and other items that we could help tell the stories of Springfield for the bicentennial year. And uh, in the first call for photographs, we got about 4,000 pictures. And the majority of them were wonderful pictures, great shots. You could see that there were things in them that helped you identify them as Springfield. But uh, beyond that, these people didn't know anything about them. They, they had acquired them from their parents or their grandparents or whoever. And, and one of the focuses of my talk tonight is to tell you about the history of this area and about music in this area, but also to tell you that as that, as that sliding timeline moves along, we didn't get these people to identify the people in these photographs. And the next generation didn't get their people to identify those photographs. And we're just that same way. If you've got old photographs that are your parents that, or whoever's, that you know who's in them, you better be writing it down because the kids that are 50 years old, which I consider a kid, the kids that are 50 years old, at some point in time, some of them are going to see the light and going to want to know who is in that picture and why. And, and if you don't do that, if you don't document who's in them, uh, they're lost. They're just lost. And also, if they have anything to do with history or, or events or things that happen uh, here or wherever, uh, get a copy of them to those places so that they can go in the archives of, of museums or, or other, um, like MSU's special collections or wherever. Uh, we're, we're not we're not territorial, we're not possessive about them. And that's one of the most wonderful things about working in that genre here, is because our library, MSU, Drury, uh, us, all of, those, all of those facilities that are all looking for those photographs share and work with each other in a way that you don't, you don't hold them like this, you spread them out and let people see them because that's the most fun of it. You see a guy like Wayne Glenn who, who just tells masterful stories every day and uh, using those photographs and using his own collection, which is extensive. Uh, it, it, it helps people understand. It's like when I talk about there being two Springfields, a lot of people don't realize that there were two Springfields for 17 years. From 1870 to 1887, there was a Springfield and North Springfield. And that's why there's such a, a divide in the city of Springfield and the people that are here is because it, it goes all the way back to the coming of the railroad in 1870. They built the railroad north of the city and they offered the city to build a depot if the city, or to build a spur line down to the city if the city would build them a depot. And the city chose not to. And in along with that, a group of investors bought all the land along the railroad right away and worked with the railroad to build a second town. And that's why we have a Division Street. And when you talk to kids about that and you explain to them why that's called Division Street and you see that light go on, they want to know more. They want to dig into that deeper. And those are the kinds of interesting things that, that, that explain stuff. It's like why we have a Central Street with the courthouse and the city hall and the library and the high school and everything along Central Street is because when the two cities merged back together, it was halfway between the two business districts. And either business district had an undue advantage over all of the state and city and federal government buildings. They were all away from those two business districts. So those kinds of things, it just, I know you came to hear something about music and I'll try to do my best to do that. But I also understand that when I get wound up on this, you just, you just need to sit and listen or go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, this is the Springfield Military Band. Uh, during this time in the 1800s, Springfield was, uh, it had been a big center during the Civil War. It had lots of veterans and lots of people that enjoyed music. And this was a, it was a brass band, uh, one of several that Springfield had during this time in the late 1800s. And I've got several pictures of them here. Uh, this is another, this was the, the first uh, military band to uh, have stringed instruments and so on in it that was uh, taken outside of, of one of the churches downtown. And uh, then this is, of course, Little Hoover. Little Hoover, Hoover Music. Uh, Little Hoover had his brass band. And this is, uh, uh, 
This is a picture of his band taken in the uh, uh, pavilion at uh, Phelps Grove Park. If you have questions, by the way, I'd love to answer them if I can or make something up, whatever you need. Uh, just, just raise your hand or just ask. And this is a great one. I wish you could see this in better detail. And of course, you will be able to if you look at this online. Uh, this is a picture of one of the brass bands taken at the old fairgrounds. Now, the fairgrounds was at the corner of Holland and Grand, where the parking structure is for MSU there on the northeast corner of Holland and Grand. That's where the fairgrounds was. They had a mile and a quarter race track, horse racing track, uh, had exhibition buildings and everything. And the, the fairgrounds was, uh, was there for many years. It had been developed there by John Paul Campbell's family who lived over on Jefferson Street where the Jarrett Junior High School is. Their family home and all their land was right there on, uh, on Jefferson. And of course we had uh, uh, ethnic groups that, that we had a lot of African Americans here at that time. Uh, this is the Women's Music Society Club of Springfield, an African American uh, group of ladies uh, who loved to uh, sing and play music and also to uh, had a book club. And this was taken in 1915 uh, in one of their homes. So that's, uh, there, was, there was just great, great musical entities here uh, of all races and uh, a lot of the uh, a lot of our Afro-American musicians, as I'll show you later on in these pictures, uh, developed uh, to be tremendous entertainers. Tremendous entertainers were, you know, renowned well beyond Springfield. This is a souvenir of the first annual music festival at Southwest Missouri State Teachers College. This was in 1920. And uh, it was also the fourth annual high school music contest and the, the uh, fourth, yeah, fourth annual high school music contest, along with being the first college music, uh, music competition. Uh, the coming of MSU, uh, or SMS, or STC, as it was called back then, uh, really opened up a lot of exposure of uh, classical music, of opera, of other things that, uh, that uh, a lot of the people that uh, that went to school there uh, went out into the community and were very uh, important in the development of things uh, of all genres of music here in Springfield. And this is a biggie. This is, uh, there was a man that came here in the late teens to be the director of music for the Springfield Public Schools. And his name was R. Richie Robertson. And he was, uh, he was a Scotsman, uh, very military bearing, liked wearing uniforms. Uh, he came here to, to develop the music program in the public schools. And he is, uh, he's the godfather of everything musical as far as uh, orchestral, uh, things like that. He, he started the uh, Sprinkle Symphony or was an impetus of that. Uh, he was the uh, uh, founder of the uh, Kilties, the Women's uh, Drum Bugle Corps. He started all the bands in all levels of school system in the city of Springfield. High school band, junior high, grade school, all the music programs, he developed them all. Uh, he also, this is his biggest uh, and most famous entity. This is a picture uh, taken in St. Louis when the 400 member Boy Scout band performed there for the governor, uh, a, a 400, they, had, they audited, had auditions and they had four levels of musicians. And they would audition and then they would be put in one of the levels and they would work their way through and work their way up to being in the, in the different entities of this, of this band. There was a 400 person marching band and then there were smaller entities that went out and, and performed in schools and all types of uh, parades all over the Midwest. Uh, but it was, in its, it was and has been the biggest Boy Scout band in history with 400 plus members. And uh, R. Richie Robertson and his son, who later became the director of the uh, Springfield Symphony, were two, uh, 
two great, uh, just amazing driving forces in developing the music and the, the appreciation of music in the city of Springfield. And this is another one. This is Southwest Missouri uh, Community Chorus. This is a uh, singing groups that uh, were just like the, uh, as the community uh, symphony, but uh, all vocal music. And this is their first uh, uh, show. This is in 1921. And uh, that's about 200 performers doing vocal music. And uh, I'm not sure, but I think this, uh, this is uh, the old First Baptist Church uh, where this was taken. It doesn't say. It just says Springfield. But I think it's the old, the old uh, First Baptist Church with a huge pipe organ up behind it and everything. This is the Springfield Symphony when it first started. They performed at uh, uh, the Shrine Mosque. Many of the, many of the groups. Uh, the Shrine Mosque opened 100 years ago last month, or two months ago, October. And uh, the opening of the Shrine Mosque here was a huge piece of, uh, of progress. Uh, a wonderful facility with great acoustics uh, that would seat 4,000 people. And it was for many years the biggest... Uh, auditorium on Route 66 all the way from Chicago to Los Angeles and uh, it housed every kind of musical entertainment from Glenn Miller to Elvis Presley over the course of time uh, we've got great pictures of of Louis Armstrong yeah uh, I'd always heard that John Philip Sousa played here do you know anything about that? Sousa was at the Landers and, and did a concert at the Landers I don't know about the shrine but it wouldn't surprise me I can I can research that and find some, see if I can find something, but I do know he did one at the uh, at the Landers. Uh, Landers opened in 1909, and all of those theaters downtown were all vaudeville houses, and so they all had bands and, and little orchestras and pipe organs and and uh, uh, matter of fact that's what burned the Fox Theater was the compressor on the pipe organ uh, caught fire and. Uh, the fire got blown up onto the roof of the building and collapsed the roof down into the theater in 1947. And, uh, but yeah, beautiful, beautiful pipe organs in all those old theaters like that. And wonderful organists to play them. But this is the symphony, uh, and the conductor in these pictures is uh, uh, our Richie Robertson's son, who was uh, the, the conductor of the symphony here for over 20 years. There's another one. All of those in the Shrine Mosque. But Shrine's amazing. Uh, it give you a, a feel for something that's you know, not that pleasant. But a lot of the entertainers that were African American who came here, like Louis Armstrong. Louis Armstrong had to stay in his dressing room uh, because there was no place that would allow him to stay overnight in the city of Springfield when he traveled here, 1953. And... Uh, they would, either, they would either do that or they would go up to Graham's. Graham's Barbecue had six little cabins, and the entertainers would, would go up to, to Graham's and stay the night up there and then come back to the shrine and perform. But lots of, uh, lots of them. And then this is Drury. This is Drury's uh, Conservatory of Music, 1929-30. Uh, and this is their uh, training outside of the, the music uh, building there at, at uh, Drury. And... Uh, they just remodeled that building. It's beautiful now. It's a, uh, it's a lovely old building, but it's just been redone. Yeah, the acoustics in there are wonderful. That's the other thing. That's the amazing thing about the Shrine Mosque. A lot of people don't know that that whole ceiling in the Shrine Mosque is, or was, it isn't anymore, but it was stretched canvas over steel, over steel, grill, work, steel grill work so that they didn't have to have center posts in that building to support that heavy ceiling. The ceiling had no weight to it. It was painted to look like plaster, but it was actually double thickness canvas. And uh, no, the whole ceiling was made out of that. Uh, over, you know, it was just attachment points to the, uh, to the grids above it that held up the roof. And uh, as it began to deteriorate over time, it would split at the seams and you could see down to the floor way below there's little metal catwalks like to uh lower the ring for the lower the ring light for wrestling when they had wrestling there you, you'd have to go up and go out on this little catwalk and lower that light down above the stay above the the uh 
Yeah, where they wrestled, the ring where they wrestled. And uh, it was pretty scary. <laughs> it looked like a long, long way down there to those cracks in that can. You knew it wouldn't hold you if you fell on it. So you stayed in the middle of that little catwalk and just inched up there and lowered it down and got back down as quick as you could. Now it's done it again and it's gone all the way back to the beginning. And that's not fun. Computer, along with everything else, is having a nervous breakdown. Well, now it's back to where it was. Okay. As I said, uh, the Shrine Mosque had a lot of uh, uh, shows in it, and many of them were like this one. Uh, this is one of the early country western hillbilly music shows. Uh, that seemed to be very attractive to the radio audiences here. And uh, at one time, uh, KWTO had over 100 musicians on staff. Just everybody that played an instrument or sang or whatever. Uh, they were on staff at the, at the radio station uh, and all the other stations as well. Well, the KBTO and uh, KGBX and then a little later on KTTS had, had online, had staff musicians that played with them. And then they would do these other shows and travel and go all over this area entertaining for uh, groups and events and then on uh, sidelight then promoting their uh, uh, promoting their radio station, whichever one it happened to be. KGBX and KW, KWTO and KGBX were actually owned by the same company for many years. And then the, the FCC during World War II forced them to separate. And when they separated, uh, the owners decided to keep KWTO, keep watching the Ozarks, and sell off KGBX which is the station they had brought here from St. Joseph, Missouri in the beginning. And so the Duval family that owned the newspaper bought that radio station. And for some reason, they came to the conclusion that they needed to build a building that would be just exclusively for that radio station. So the KGBX building that's next door to where the old newspaper building was on Boonville Street is the first building west of the Mississippi built exclusively to be a radio station. The walls inside are a foot and a half thick. Uh, there's double pane glass between all the studios. The doors are soundproof and have slides on the bottom of them. It was made specifically to be a radio station and it, it's, a, it's a fascinating building to go in. But then when the Duval family decided they were gonna get into television, they did the same thing. They decided that they wanted to build a building that was exclusively as a television station. So they allowed KTTS television to get on the air six months ahead of them because they had to build that building and KTTS could move right into their own their radio studios uh, on the second floor of the building there at Jefferson and uh, Walnut. Here's another group of uh, radio pioneers. Uh, Aunt Martha, uh, Slim Wilson's sister, is in the back. Uh, taller than anybody else there with her little sunbonnet on. And then her son, Speedy Hallworth, down here in front. These are a bunch of people all dressed uh, the same for some kind of an activity, except for Bill Ring, uh, who is in bib overalls in the middle. And this is, the, the Bill Ring, uh, well, Bill Ring was kind of like real chapel. Bill had thins and wides, thins and wides, and so this is, this is thin Bill, and, it, and it's kind of startling. It doesn't look a lot like him, uh, but at least he doesn't have on a fringe coat and face hair like Wild Bill Hickok. Uh, Rule's not here, is he? Okay, all right, moving on. Uh, but this is taken in one of the radio studios, and they're in there practicing, getting ready for some kind of an event, and... Uh, it, you can tell it's, it's real music because they've got a, a trumpet with a mute on it and a banjo and an accordion. So uh, they're, they're really going to go to town there. And then here's the best one. This is Bill as he's getting wider. And this was Corns of Kraken. Now Corns of Kraken was the radio show that was developed before the Ozark Jubilee. It was the, the penultimate radio show. It would sometimes attract several thousand people to the Shrine Mosque 
to watch the performance. And Bill Ring uh, got a uh, sponsorship from a local tent and awning company. And they made him a suit out of awning material. And, and you can't see it because the stripes are blacking it out. But up there at the very back, he has on, and you, if you want to come up here and look at it, he has a suit out of striped awning material that he wore in all the shows during the time, and he would mention this awning, awning company and, and how they had made him a suit. Uh, yeah, it was just crazy. But the, yeah, this is, this is a great picture because it's got a who's who of local musicians, everybody from Slim Wilson, Speedy Hallworth, um, Goo Goo Rutledge, uh, you name it, uh, if they were in radio and they were doing music, uh, they were at the Shrine Mosque for one of these shows. And uh, it's, uh, it really is uh, in some neat stuff. And neat that we've got all the names in there. Did they broadcast live on the radio from the Shrine? Yeah, yeah. So they would have an audience. Yeah, they'd have an, a huge audience. And the, I think the record was around 4,000 for, for the radio. So we've got some pic interior pictures during the show when the shrine was just absolutely packed, the floor, everything, just solid people. And it was, yeah, yeah, it was Wellhiners. Uh, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely suit, and it, and it's vertical striped, so it is slimming. <laughs> and here's another one taking the shrine, and this one uh, uh, has uh, Mr. Black, who was uh, one of the people with uh, the radio station and uh, Slim and a bunch of people and then Aunt Martha and two other ladies singing in the middle. Uh, you can always identify Aunt Martha because she's a head taller than anybody else. She and Slim are brother and sister. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. And then here's another one. And this is, uh, this is when uh, uh, Bill has gone to full on wide. Uh, and uh, this is a, one of the show, one of the other music shows. They syndicated a lot of these music shows, uh, little 15-minute shows, and they would they would sit and tape two or three hours of them, and then send them out on these huge discs uh, for for other stations to play. And this one is the Laro Feed Hour, and the Red Star Flower, Laro Feed and Red Star Flower. You always got to wonder about flour that's made by the same people that make the farmer's feed. And the opera was very big and always has been here. Springfield Music Club and the high school music department, led by our Richie Robertson, uh, had a, uh, the, an opera called The Bohemian Girl. This was in April of 1930 at Shrine Mosque. And there were other venues uh, other than the shrine, smaller venues. This is the downtown Pat Pancake House, which was originally Aunt Martha's. And they had the downtown country jubilee every Saturday night at 8 o'clock. Family entertainment along with uh, seafood and uh, fried chicken. And it was open 24 hours a day. But they would uh, they'd show, they've got a picture of their... Uh, uh, performers on stage and also a picture of the sign that was out front. It was right around the corner from the Jewel Theater on McDaniel Street. And here's Lions Music which was across the street at Jefferson McDaniel. There next to the uh, uh, Colonial Hotel. This is a um, testimonial about, it went away again, testimonial about uh, why this is driving me crazy. Uh, testimony about uh, pianos at Lions Music by Liberace. Well, one thing leads to another. If I can't find the cursor, this is going to be ah, there it is. Liberace was actually at Lions. No, no, it, it was a paid uh, paid testimonial. Uh, let's see if we can go back to that and then move on from there. And then I've got in our collection a uh, pretty significant amount of local sheet music. Sheet music dedicated to something here. Uh, like this is a, a piece uh, written by Will James, Will James Music, which was a famous music store here in Springfield, uh, called The Ozarks Are Calling You. And it's, uh, it's uh, words by uh, Geraldine. I can't make out the last part of it. 
from this picture. And you'll see it's been taped back together, but it's uh, the Ozarks are calling you. We had a lot of, a lot of local musicians that published their uh, sheet music. And then you would have somebody that would sit in the music stores and play them on the piano and hope people liked it and they would buy the music. This is the Foggy River Boys, uh, favorite gospel songs. Uh, some of the Matthews brothers are in this one. Um, but this is a, a dollar for this favorite gospel songs book by the Foggy River Boys. And then along after that, uh, after I get this out of the way, after that, then uh, this is the Jordanaires. Now they played, they sang behind uh, uh, Elvis, and and uh, they were also the Matthews were involved in this as well. And uh, this is my journey to the sky, arranged by Monty Matthews, as introduced by the Jordanaires. And uh, the Laddies. This is one uh, written. The music was written by our Richie Robertson for this one. The Laddies from Missouri is about. Uh, uh, World War One, and it's part uh, by the Robertson Chris Publishing Company, Springfield. And then this one is uh, this is the best best ever. This is a uh, words uh, called "Everybody's Setting Jake in Springfield," uh, and it's played to the melody of "O oh, Susanna," and it's a booster song put out by the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, dedicated to the many boosters of Springfield, Missouri, and uh, it just, it's just all about Springfield and how great it, it was to live here uh, back in the 1930s. And then, of course, there's Slim, Slim Wilson, uh, great uh, singer, great promoter for this area, and this is the finest collection of cowboy and mountain ballads and pictures of your favorite radio artists. 75 cents for this little one. So this this had to be some pretty pricey stuff uh, The prairie he, slim pick slim pickens Wilson and his prairie playboys as heard on the 5,000 watt KWTO 560 This is one of the uh, events downtown. This was Ernest Tubb came in to visit uh, at Hoover music and then here's another interior shot of the music department with records and sheet music and then back in the back was little booths where you could go in and listen to them and see if you liked them. And this is their front window promoting uh, the uh, 4th of July. And then here's one promoting, uh, well this is promoting the uh, Corns of Kraken at the Shrine Mosque had all the people, featured players at the Shrine Mosque uh, promoting KWTO and the Mutual Broadcasting Company and the Hoover Music. This is when they were on South Street. And then here's the Ellie Lines Temple of Music, a four-story building uh, on uh, Boonville Street that was the music store on the first floor and then up above was other offices. This is a, a promotion uh, talking about uh, some activities they were going to have for the summer. And a lot of kids wanted to learn to play the instruments of some sort. This is the Rainbow School of Music guitar class. Uh, they were located on East McDaniel Street, just, uh, just off of South Street, between South Street and Jefferson on McDaniel on the north side of the street. And this is the, the guitar class. And the little tiny kids along the front here that look five, six years old up to the older kids up behind, uh, each one of them with their own guitar, and uh, just excited to be there. There's probably 40 kids there standing in, in uh, the guitar class. And then here's the accordion class. So uh, yeah, they were older. Uh, it took a while to be able to squeeze an accordion. Although they do have a junior size one over here to the left. There's a couple of the younger kids that had the junior size accordions in this. But there's uh, 9, 18, uh, 22 in the accordion class. That's a lot of dedicated squeeze, squeeze box people. That's, uh, yeah. And uh, then uh, here is the uh, public recital of the, of the top players in all of the different genres. Uh, at, uh, looks like, that looks like at one of the, uh, one of the schools. 
uh, they're having the School of Music students, and that's 1932. How many Rainbow Music Place sales? It was many years. Uh, yeah, it was. You should, if, yeah, if you're, yeah, you should. Yeah, yeah, it was on St. Louis Street by then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a big place to learn to play instruments. And, uh, Oh no! They had music in the schools. I, I played in the, I played in the grade school grade school orchestra at McDaniel. Played the trumpet in the grade school orchestra, but it was right after lunch, <laughs> and it was a bad time to have a have play a trumpet. I, I liked I liked uh, I, I liked candy bars, with nuts in them, and and the spit valve will just not accommodate that. So I had to drop out of the orchestra, much to my much to my parents' delight, because my dad worked second shift. Uh, but yeah, they had, they had always had, ever since our Richie Robertson came here, they had music programs, and voc vocal music and instrumental music, in, uh, in all levels of, of the grades. But those pictures, were they private schools? They were, there was a private, yeah, a private academy. It was like, uh, uh, what was the one that uh, Jennifer Jester had? Uh, School of Rock. Yeah, it was like School of Rock type of thing. And then, and then of course, everybody uh, learned their music from church. This is the uh, Reedy Chapel Jubilee Choir. Uh, and they, uh, a lot of the African-American entertainers came out of choir music and, de and developed their skills in choir music, like this group right here. This is the, uh, this is the first entity of the uh, uh, Philharmonics. That played uh, or sang in in on the Jubilee, were the very first African American singing group to be a regular featured player on television, and uh, they they did some wonderful stuff. Sadly, the the young man in the back in the middle uh, was killed in the Korean War, and uh, they replaced him after the after he went to two of these actually no three three of these four were all drafted and served in Korea uh, and then came back and got back involved in, in this. It became from, went from a quartet uh, singing in church uh, to uh, making quite a name for themselves all over. This is them getting ready to leave on one of their tours and they toured all over the Midwest singing, uh, uh, singing in, at events and, and in, in venues all over the place down at Lake, at Lake of the Ozarks and down at Table Rock uh, and then other places all over. Uh, traveled around in this, in this big old Buick because they, and slept in it most of the time because there was not a lot of places that would allow them to sleep there. But uh, some good, good people there. The young man on the left with his collar turned up, Mr. Joe Cool, uh, is Homer Boyd. Homer was a good friend and I learned a lot from him. And that's another thing. These, this, that we're doing here as Music Monday. The preservation of the oral histories uh, is so vital and so important. MSU is doing a great job with it. We're doing a good job with it here at Music Monday. We're doing a good job with it at the History Museum because nobody can tell it better than the people that actually experienced it. And this uh, Homer did some wonderful tapes for us talking about his travels, talking about experiences he had as a young man growing up here in Springfield and so on. Uh, it's, it's vital that we, that we continue that effort and support it in any way we can to make sure that we all pass on that knowledge so that the next group can understand why things were the way they were or understand why the hell were they the way they were. Either way. Uh, yeah, Homer, uh, at that time, uh, uh, blacks weren't allowed in the movie theaters except on specific days and only at the landers and only up on the third or the second balcony. And the second balcony had a separate entrance. They couldn't go in the front lobby. They had to go in the side entrance, take the stairway to the second balcony, watch the movie. There was only three days a week when they could go to the movies. Now, here's a guy that's just fought in Korea and he's come home from the war, and he wants to go see a movie, and he can't go. 
and it just devastated him. He left here and worked in Minnesota for many years and came back after he retired uh, because his family was here, but he, he left here right after that and, uh, and didn't come back. Uh, this is another one of their, this is an event, the Laclede County Fox Hunters Association. And uh, one of their features was uh, a couple, uh, was Connie Lee Mace from the Ozark Opry and uh, the uh, Philharmonics. That was 1955. This is a, this is a good one here. This, uh, that man leaning on the bass back there uh, became one of the most famous bass players in the country and uh, played with uh, musicians of way up the list of, of uh, musicians all over this area. And uh, then came back home uh, and started his own group. Uh, this is him and, and Homer Boyd and a couple of other people uh, after he had started his group here in town. And this is them featured in the Springfield Association of jazz musicians. This is their big concert and uh, Dallas Bartley is his name. Dallas Bartley was a famous bass player uh, and he came back here and, and uh, played and taught and, and was just a, a tremendous musician and tremendous input here in Springfield. This is the Dallas Bartley. He directed this group that uh, had the jazz musicians group and now it's gone back to Liberace. Okay, now. Let's see. You're getting close. There we go. And this is an interesting, uh, interesting one. Uh, we talk about, you know, this is something we, we've talked about a lot of the groups that that were here and were featured and did uh, big events and things like that. There were so many wonderful groups here in Springfield that were house bands. Uh, Teresa Spain and the Little People at the Alibi, or uh, uh, you know, just just people that uh, that played at the 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 bars that were great musicians that we didn't uh, that we we need to we need to find and document them better. We, we've, got, we've got the Daredevils and we've got people like that, but these people that were here every day playing hard and, and entertaining right here locally, uh, we, need to, we need to find ways to recapture that if, if at all possible and acknowledge the, the amount of, of entertainment that went on on any given night uh, here in Springfield, and, uh, just my own personal thing. This is uh, the Stein Club, 5% beer featuring Dave Bedell's orchestra with the Springfield's largest patio. And so it's got pictures here of, of uh, Bebop Brown and, and uh, um, all the different groups um, that played at the Stein Club. It was down on Jones Alley. Yeah. Just in there behind Pitt's Chapel. Yeah. And then, of course, here's people from way away from here that came in. This is the uh, five uh, people that were supposedly rotating through as the hosts of the Five Star Jubilee that took over for the Ozark Jubilee. And uh, this is a promotional picture for them taken out at the Cox Farm. And then this is, this is another one that's, that's, this is a country music show uh, done at Channel 10 at KTTS. You don't think much about it. You think most of it was Channel 3. But this is one at KTTS, and uh, I have no idea who these people are, and there's no, there's no names on this photo. This is one of uh, G. Pearson Ward's pictures. We got all of Mr. Ward. He was, the, he was the station manager at KTTS Radio and Television, and he started... He started the first radio station in Springfield because they assigned him the job of selling radios. He was in the Victrola department at HERS, and they assigned him to sell radios, and he said, well, I, there's no radio station. And they said, well, that's, that's not our problem. You need to sell radios. 
And so he went up and strung an antenna on the roof of the Hearst building and started the first radio station in Springfield and would play intermittently. Just He would put little ads in the paper that were going to play for an hour on such and such a day. And uh, so he, that was how he built his business, selling, Victrola, selling radios from the Victrola department. And then he became the station manager for KTTS when they went on the air in 1940 and stayed with them up till they sold out many, many, many years later. But this is another one, like I'm saying, here's a picture. You got a cameraman, you got a guy playing the guitar, a guy playing the steel guitar, and a lady sitting at a desk singing and uh, uh, with an interesting backdrop. And uh, we have no idea who it is. And that's a loss. That's too bad. That's, that's people lost to, lost to history that shouldn't be. And here's a great one. I had no idea of this until I was looking through some photos. We had two different thrillcades here. How many of you know what a thrillcade is? You know, crazy wrecking cars and running fast around the track and doing all kinds of maniac stuff. Jumping cars over lines of other cars and things like that. The music man, high notes and highlights, they had a band all dressed up like circus clowns that rode on one of the thrillcade cars at speed around the track at the fairgrounds. And then they had another three-piece group with two guitars and a bass, a stand-up bass, on a platform that raised up out of the bed of a pickup truck that they would drive around. And, I mean, you, this, this picture is one of those, say, what? It, uh, it's amazing. And they were a big part of the entertainment of the thrillcade was these, these people playing while there's no safety involved at all. I mean, I don't see their shoes bolted to the floor or anything. I mean, they're just up there playing, playing jug band stuff in this one and playing instrumental music in the other one while riding around a racetrack on these, on, yeah, yeah, on these thrillcade cars. I just, I, I, was, I was stunned at that one. And then, uh, as I said, everybody was involved. Here is a four-piece uh, band of uh, policemen, all playing their guitars. Uh, and we have the names of these. This is from the police collection of the police department. But this was in 1931. And they're all, uh, they had a little, little group that they would play and entertain for organizations as a police department. Now, here's one. And these people look familiar. If there's anybody up here that uh, thinks they can identify these people, please let us know. This is what I'm talking about. Here's something that is, uh, I don't know, it, it, it's got to be close to our age. It's, seriously, if you want to come up here and take a look and think of it is, I, I, I'd love to know because we've got this picture along with hundreds of others that we have no names on, and I'd love to have, I'd love to have the pictures. Huh? We don't have any idea. See, that's the thing. A lot of these, for many years, when we were over by Drury in the old uh, Bentley house, uh, we were like a foundling home, if you don't know what that is. We would, uh, we would come to work at the museum, and there would be like a basket of stuff up by the front door on the porch, and it would have a note. Uh, we know you'll want this. It's very important. And it would be just a pile of negatives or a pile of photographs or, or somebody's old uh, shoes. I mean, it was just amazing. But we would find stuff at least once a week, if not more, just set. And we, have no way of, we had no way of, of accessing it, no way of putting information to it, other than just basket of stuff. So uh, a lot of these pictures that are from this genre are just, uh, they came to us by happenstance. And uh, so if anybody wants to take a look at this one, uh, they, the one guy looks familiar to me. The one guy on the ladder looks very familiar to me, but I can't place him. And then this one, I mean, uh, this looks like a, a, a bluegrass band uh, that I would say, you know, but is it it's at a school somewhere, because they're up on the stage in front of school. A guy playing the washboard, a guy on the banjo, and a guy on the fiddle. And uh, so I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's not homegrown. I know them. But other than that, I don't know. 
Chris? No? That's what I thought, man. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, it looks like Rick over there on the washboard. Yeah. And the banjo player is... Uh, Rick? I don't know. They look familiar to me, too. You'll be able to see it when they, when they play this video. Yeah. Yeah, all of these pictures will be on that video. Any idea, Chris? Okay. Yeah, they all look familiar to me, but I can't for the life of me tell you why. Uh, other than, you know. Yeah. Hmm. I don't know about that. Anyway, uh, but those are, those are some of the things that we're trying to do, is we're trying to identify what we do have and trying to help people identify what they, what they need identified. And uh, people bring us in or call me on the phone and say, you know, this or that. Uh, and I try to help them as best I can with house numbers and things like that sort. In case you don't know, all the house numbers in Springfield changed in 1947. Uh, the, the post office had been after the city to standardize the numbers of all, this, all the house numbers since 1920. And the city held them at bay for 27 years until 47 when they couldn't do it any longer. The, the post office said, we're going to stop delivering the mail. So all of the downtown numbers had to be standardized to cross streets. So every street going east-west at National Street had to break the 1100-1200 block. And every street and every north south street had to break at all of the main thoroughfares the same hundred block for all the streets so like st louis street went from my house was at 738 became 938 and and some of the houses were even misnumbered so that they had to change the whole number so i've got a cross reference at the at the museum in my office that i can tell you what the number was before 1947 and after. Because we get people that call up and say, I'm just in town for a day, and my Aunt Minnie lived at such and such street at such and such number. And I've gone by there, and there's an old house there, but it's not the old house that's in the pictures I have. And I go to my book, and I look, and I say, well, you're two blocks off, or you're a block off, or you're, you know, and tell them where the other house is. And they'll go, and they'll call me back and say, oh, I found it. Thank you very much. How come? Why is it that way? I say, well, they changed the numbers. No, it's always been odd on one side, even on the other. And uh, yeah, odd on the, on the north and west and even on the east and south. But, uh, but they, were, they were not supposed to be numbered sequentially. And some of these little subdivisions, they numbered houses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and so on. And so they had to, they had to have at least a three-number gap was what they required between the houses. And uh, so when they renumbered, it was, it was a mess there in, the, in 1947. It was as bad there. It was as bad there as when, when they added the university to the phone numbers. That was that was ugly. That was the ugliest of all. Tuxedo. Yeah, they added tuxedo out south and then added UN to the numbers in town. And so, and if you didn't dial it, he didn't get through, and it was just pandemonium. So, anybody else got any questions? This is this is the part I like to do. Is, is, is yes. We're 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 working on a project of that right as we uh, uh, as we talk. We're working on we're working on that activity and how we're going to do that. We've got we're probably going to turn that over to a senior intern that is needing some hours, and we're going to let them work with us on that because there are a lot of we have a lot of photographs that we need to we need some definition to. Anything else? Anybody else got questions? Because I'd love to, I'd love to answer. Or anything, even if it doesn't have anything to do with music, you just wonder about it. Yes. So you're in the Barnes building. Yep. All right. So, uh, Mr. Smith was my great great grandfather. Yeah. Uh, the building, the, the Barnes building is not the same building as this house. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, the, the Barnes the building, see, that whole corner of the square from St. Louis Street to Boonville burned to the ground in 1913. Which, by the way, two of the greatest pictures in all, that I do in all of my then and now pictures is a picture of the square. The city bought all new gas-powered fire trucks. 
and they were so proud of them, they arrayed them all in front of the northeast corner of the square and took pictures of them. One month to the day later, that whole corner burned to the ground. Uh, not, not really, no. Yeah, no. There was a lot of them here, but I don't know names or anything. Yeah. Yeah, Gordon McCann would be the one to talk to on that, and and you need to talk to him in a hurry. There were a lot of steel guitar players here, too. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yes, sir. Uh-huh. I don't, let's see, let's see if we'll see here. And it faded away again. You're killing me, Smalls. All right, um, I think the computer has finally died because it's gone to black and it's not even showing a picture now. So I'm sorry. But they'll all be in that, uh, in the video and make sure and look at them. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Uh, they said it would never be a success. Uh, something, there was some kind of a phrase they used about, uh, the, about, the, about the moon and, and it being over the moon if it would ever become a successful community. And it, and it did. It was very successful. What was successful. The commercial street. That was North Springfield. That was the business district of a separate city. Well, that was way before our time. That was back in the day, and people, you know. There was a family that were a bunch of attorneys, and their name was Moon. Yeah. And they, their office was up. Yeah, Moon, Moon, and Moon. Yeah. 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 Bill, Moon. Bill had a bar. He wasn't an attorney. He had a bar. <laughs> yeah, we're... Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. John, thank you. You bet. Happy to do it. This has been a great, it's been a great presentation here, and I don't know about the rest of you, but I can listen to this for hours and hours.